I had never intended to get into the comic book business. You know, I, I wanted to be a real writer. So I thought, well, it'll be a temporary job. I'll just stay long enough to get some experience, and then I'll get into the real world. But it became so interesting, and there were changes every day. There were new things happening, and I was learning new things. And before I knew it, I was there for 50 years. <laughs> for the first number of years, I had been writing the books, the comic books, the way my publisher wanted me to, which you have to do when you work for a publisher. And I really was getting more and more unhappy after a while. I used to tell my wife, I want to quit. I'm getting tired of writing these silly, childish stories. All the characters seemed one-dimensional. The dialogue I found banal. He didn't like us to use words of more than two syllables or even one syllable. And um, as far as characterization, a hero would be walking down the street and see somebody rob a bank, and he sa he'd say, I'd better catch him before he gets away, and you know, that was the dialogue. Or it would be, pow, suck, take that, you rat. It, it, I wasn't enjoying it. So in 1961, I did a book called The Fantastic Four. That was the first one of the Marvel books. <laughs> This was a little different than most. It was four superheroes, but instead of them always getting along well and uh, they always caught the criminal on the last page and everything was fine, I tried to make these four more realistic. They would quarrel amongst themselves. One of them would say, I want to quit this group. I'm not getting paid enough money. Why should I risk my life and you're not paying me enough? You know, and things like that. I tried to think what would real people do and say in situations like this. Instead of a girlfriend of the hero who didn't know that the hero was really a great crime fighter, I made the girl his fiance, and she not only knew who he was, but she was his partner, you know. And so I tried to reverse a lot of things. The book was very successful, so successful that I was asked to come up with another hero. So the next one I did was The Incredible Hulk. And again, in trying to do something different, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to make a hero out of a monster? I remembered the old movie Frankenstein starring Boris Karloff, and to me, in that movie, the monster was really the hero. He didn't want to hurt anybody, but he was always being chased by those idiots with the flaming torches up and down hills and everything. And I, I thought, I'm going to get a monster and make him the good guy. Then I remembered I always liked Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I thought, what if the monster is really a normal person who turns into the monster and back again and can't control the changes. So I combined the two, the Frankenstein monster with Jekyll and Hyde, and I called him the Incredible Hulk, and uh, the rest is history. In 1962, I was asked to do another one, and um, again, I was trying to think, what can I do that's different? So I felt that um, I would like to, for once, do a strip about a teenager who isn't a sidekick, but he is the hero, and I want to make him like a real teenager. He's not a guy who can do anything and never has a problem. So I thought it would be fun to get a kid who has to worry about making a living, who has to worry about getting dates with girls, because even though he'd be a superhero, he wouldn't be that popular. You know, there's no law that says if you're a superhero, every girl wants to date you. And I thought, I, I'm going to take this silly subject, a guy with a superpower, and make it as realistic as possible. Then I had to come up with a superpower for him. So I was sitting around wondering what to do, and I saw a fly crawling on the wall. And I said, gee, wouldn't it be something if a character could stick to the wall or a ceiling like, a, like an insect? I had my hero, but what would I call him? So I thought, well, I could call him Insect Man, but that didn't sound dramatic. I thought, Mosquito Man? Nah. And, for, and then I just went down a list of names, and when I came to Spider, I thought, Spider Man. That, that sounded dramatic. It sounded menacing. It was easy to letter, easy to read. So I thought I'd call him Spider Man, and that was the way it was done. I also tried to do the stories so that they were intelligent enough and well-written enough and had enough solid characterization and dialogue that an older, and satire, if you will, some wit, so that an older reader could get something out of them too. Now, it, as you can imagine, 
that isn't easy to do. I started using college level and above vocabulary. If I wanted to word, use a word like cataclysmic or proselytize or monolith or anything of that sort, I did. If you write well for children, they will learn those words. If they care about the story, which they do, they will take the trouble to look the word up. Because I was writing so many books a month, I found I could save time. Instead of writing a complete script, the artist and I would talk over the story. I would tell him or her what I wanted the story to be. Generally, this is who the villain is, this is what the problem is, this is how they'll resolve it, and these are a couple of little th scenes I'd like you to put in definitely. Now, beyond that, I'd say to the artist, now you go on and draw it any way you want, and if you can improve it or think of new things, go ahead. Very often, the artist would bring my story back and would have changed it so much I could hardly recognize it. Uh, the artist might have added new characters, new incidents, anything. I loved when that happened because it made it more interesting for me. I had to figure out how to write all these new elements and kept my interest up. Some artists, I would keep the dialogue very sparse because their drawings were so detailed and interesting. I didn't want to cover up too much of the drawing with my dialogue. Then I would indicate with a blue pencil, a balloon goes here, a caption goes here, and so forth. And if, the, if, if I found a page looked dull, I would put in a lot of dialogue to um, not let the reader notice how dull the drawings were. Or I'd put in a lot of sound effects um, so, as I say, it's a real collaboration between the artwork and the script. In those days, I was just, it was fun. I was just creating characters. I, I never for a minute suspected that any of them would last this long or that people would now be doing motion pictures and TV series of practically all of them. And uh, no, it's, I still can't quite believe it, really.